you know, um, before they ever happen. And I love when it speaks about wild prophecy because you know what, it's things that happen in print, and, and it's even, you get more excited when it happens. I mean, think about it, right? When someone tells you, okay, this is going to happen, you're like, yeah. And then when it happens, you're like, oh, oh my goodness. So God does that over and over and over in the Bible. Some scholars say that for Jesus alone, for the Messiah, there were three, about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah. These things that the Messiah had to fulfill, right? And some mathematicians said, in order for Jesus just to fulfill eight of those prophecies, eight, remember, eight out of 300, only eight, he said, it's, if you were to compare it to us visually today, think of Texas. We were in Texas for a long time. Texas is a big state, by the way. To fly from one side of to the other side of Texas is like flying from here to like Atlanta. That's how big Texas is. You fill Texas five foot high of nickels, five cents, and then randomly you just throw a penny in there. And then you tell the person you have one shot to find a penny. That's the percentage of Jesus fulfilling eight of the 300 prophecies. But he fulfilled every single one. The reason why I say that is because when God says it, it's going to happen. Whether we agree or not, whether we, we believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Okay? But for you and for me, Bible prophecy, I believe, was given not to scare us, by the way. If Bible prophecy scares you, you're reading it wrong. Bible prophecy is meant to prepare us. It's meant to prepare our hearts, our minds, our spiritual eyes. And honestly, I believe it was given to keep us on our toes. God wants us to be on our toes, not in a frightened way, but in a ready way. That's why I said ready or not. And again, this ties into um, this ties into the whole Passion Week. But I want to pray, and, and I want to get started. Um, and um, and I agree with my brother that, that that it was love that led Jesus to the cross, because Jesus he told the disciples. When Peter in the garden took the took the sword and chopped off, um, you know that that uh, soldier Malchus's ear. What did he tell Peter? He said, "Peter, what are you doing? You know I can call legions of angels down, right? Like I can stop this right now. But I'm not. Why? Because I love you, Peter, and I love them, Peter, and I love the world, and that's why I'm doing it. So let's pray together, and then let's get started. Father, I thank you for everything, Lord, and thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is always with us. Lord, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us, Lord. And, Father, that he always reminds us. He always comforts us. And he always teaches us. And, Lord, we're leaning on you now, Lord, to pour out your Spirit in teaching now and give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and hands and feet to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, there's no way for you and me to listen to Bible prophecy or read it without getting a little bit excited. There's no way. And I can go down line by line, just take the newspaper, the art newspaper today, and, and look at it. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 46, verse... Oh, let's talk about this. Sorry, I totally forgot. This is the week of Jesus coming up now, by the way. Think about it. This is his ministry week. Sunday, which is in the Jewish calendar, is the first day of the week, right? That's their first day. Their Sabbath is Sabbath. He entered into Jerusalem. Monday, he curses the fig tree, which is a symbol of Israel, and then he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday, he debates with religious leaders, and he gives the Olivet Discourse, and that's the day Judas betrayed Jesus. Many scholars believe that was a 20-hour day. We complain when we were 10 hours. He, he worked 20 hours that day just doing ministry. Wednesday, there really isn't recorded events on Wednesday. No one knows where he really was. Many people believe he was in Bethany, in the house of La uh, in the home of um, Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha. No, no account. Thursday, of course, we know was the Last Supper, the upper room discourse where he's up on the upper room speaking to the disciples. He washed his disciples' feet. And then the teaching on the way to Gethsemane, they sing, the garden of Gethsemane, and then Jesus is betrayed and arrested on Thursday night. 
Friday, Jesus is on trial. You realize, you know, you guys ever heard of the term kangaroo court? Kangaroo court is basically like when you do trials like incorrectly. So Jesus, if you read the account, Jesus was on trial in the middle of the night. Who does court in the middle of the night? People that are hiding something. Jesus stood in front of six different groups of people and didn't say anything. The only thing he said is the only power you have is what's given to you from above, he said. And then they said, why are you the Messiah? He said, because they, they said, swear by God, they said. He had no choice but to say it because he loved his father. He said, I am. That was it. And then, of course, Friday, he hung on the cross. Okay? Contrary to what many people believe, he was, he was on the cross early in the morning, 9 o'clock. He hung until 3, and that was it. They had to get him down before sundown. That was Jewish tradition. They could not... They could not because it was Passover. By the way, Passover starts today, officially. You guys got this in your minds right now? Take pictures. This is the verse I want to read. Isaiah chapter 46, 9 through 10. It says, remember the things I have done in the past. This is God talking to the people through Isaiah. Remember the things I have done in the past. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Everyone should say amen to that. Only I can tell you the future before it ever even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. I went in a very simple translation. Because you know what? I like the way this was um, being told. So you're saying, John, it's Palm Sunday, can you get to that? I will. <clears throat> but what if I told you that Palm Sunday was fulfilled prophecy? Because it is. What if I told you that the day Jesus rode on the donkey into J Jerusalem, which scholars, most of them agree, is right about April 6, 32 AD, was told 500, 600 years before he ever stepped foot in Jerusalem. I can go into detail, but I'm not going to bore you with the dates and stuff because it's number of days and, you know, 183,000 blah, 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 number of days from the time that Nehemiah was going to build the wall and then count from there. The Jews know how to do the math. They're good at that. And what happens? They said, on this day, your Messiah will come into Jerusalem. And they even specified what he's going to ride on. They didn't say he's going to walk in. They didn't say he's going to run in. They didn't say he's going to come from heaven on a horse. They said he's going to come in riding a little baby donkey. That's never been written before. By the way, you ever try to tame a donkey? They're very hard to tame. But when the Creator is sitting on top of the creation, the creation listens. Isn't that amazing? They were all like that donkey. Imagine <laughs> 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 someone told you that, that on whatever day, pick a day, and I'm not setting dates, Jesus is coming back. Wouldn't you get excited? Yes. And you know it was true, by the way. Yes. It was God telling you. Um, I'm not going to even say a day. We would get ready, would we not? Well, we better if we call ourselves Christians. That's exactly what happened. And as we read later on, you're going to see that Jesus holds the Jewish nation accountable. So don't think that he won't hold us accountable that we don't know our Bibles. Christian, you realize the only instruction that we have as Christians is the Word of God. If we don't know the Bible, what are we living by? What am I living by? The gospel of the world? Oh, no. That's scary. Remember, Jesus lived.
lived a life for about 30 years that no one even knew where he was. He was just, he was known as, honestly, Joseph's kid. He was known as the carpenter from Nazareth. And all of a sudden, he bursts on the scene. The devil knew who he was, by the way. Because the devil tried to kill him before he was even two. He was born, the devil tried to kill him. Why do you think the devil tried to get rid of every child under the age of two? Do you think he hated all the people? He was only after one boy. But the, most people did not. I read this great quote by, if you guys have ever heard of Bill Hybels, he's a, um, he's a pastor out of Chicago, um, and he said this in 2004. And this, he's talking about Palm Sunday. And it's a great... Um, you know, segue into what I'm going to say. And he said this. He said, everyone who lined the streets had a different reason for waving those palms. He said, some were po political activists. They heard Jesus had supernatural power and they wanted him to use it to free Israel from Roman rule, which is true. Because Israel was under Roman rule at the time and they wanted freedom. Others had loved ones that were sick or dying. They were evangelists hoping for physical healing. Some were onlookers merely looking for something to do, while others were genuine followers who wished Jesus would establish himself as an earthly king. And I love what he says here. He said, Jesus was the only one in the parade who knew why he was going to Jerusalem to die. And then he said, he had a mission while everyone else had an agenda. Why do you follow Jesus? Do you have an agenda? Do I have an agenda? I mean, we have family members that basically think Jesus is a genie in a bottle. Going back to what I was saying, so after the age of 30, 30 to 33, Jesus began his public ministry. But he never claimed to be their king yet. Every time someone would come and he would heal them, what would he say? He would say, go and tell nobody. Only one time he told somebody, go and show yourself to the priests because he was following Jewish law. That's what they had to do. When they were cleansed of leprosy, they had to go in front of the, king, uh, the priest. The priest had to examine them and said to them, okay, you can go amongst people again. And this here, coming into Jerusalem, so how many people think, when do people, how many of you think, no, 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 back up. <laughs> what do you think is Jesus' first coming? What do you consider Jesus' first coming? It's not a trick question, it's just something. It's salvation. No, 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 it's a simpler question. What do you think, that's a good answer, but it's not right, because a lot of people believe that when Jesus was born, that was his first coming. No, the, no, 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 I'm celebrating it today. Oh. <laughs> no. coming in, that's why I said simplify it, it's a lot easier. Jesus' come, Jesus' first coming is, he's proclaiming to the world who he is. When somebody comes, they tell the world who they are. Jesus, for the first time in history, per se, is telling people, I am the Messiah. Because the Jews were looking for one. Do you remember when he met the woman at the well in John chapter 4? What did she say? Our father said the Messiah is coming. By the way, there are some Jews that are still waiting for the Messiah. Yes. There's actually a truck in New York, in New York that kicked me out of one once. Uh, because I went inside, and I, I was out, first of all, they asked me, are you Jewish? I said, no. And I said, but, this is like many years ago, I said, but, my God is Jewish. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then I went into the explanation, and the minute I said, Jesus is Messiah, he turned around and went back in the van. <laughs> okay, sorry, man, I'm going to to offend you, you know? That happened to me with a, with a, with a, um, um, the Jehovah's Witness too. The minute you say Jesus is God, they leave you alone. So if they come knocking on your door, lovingly say, I'm a Christian, and I believe that Jesus is God, they'll never come back to your house again. <laughs> they won't. But the Jews were waiting. 
They were hoping. And here's the prophecy. Zechariah 9, 9. We all know this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Every person knows daughter of Zion is the children of Israel. Okay? Zion is another name for Jerusalem, for Israel. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king. King is captain. He's coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey, which is the baby donkey. Prophecy written 500 years before Jesus steps foot into Jerusalem. Before Jesus was born. 500 years before Jesus was born. Isn't that amazing? And then it happened. People say, my Bible prophecy is boring. I'm like, what are you reading? Daniel chapter 9. By the way, do you, read, do you know that all synagogues they don't read Daniel chapter 9? There's two books in the Old two chapters in the Old Testament they don't read in synagogues. Daniel chapter 9 and Isaiah chapter 53. You know why? Because they call them New Testament chapters. Because they say he talks about Jesus, uh, the Christian Messiah. Because they know very well that the Old Testament talks about Jesus. They ignore it, they flip up, and they don't want their congregants to read it. Now look what Daniel said. And this is, I'm shortening it, but it says, No therefore understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. That is Nehemiah chapter 2. Until Messiah the Prince, that's our Messiah, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, the streets shall be built again, and the wall even trouble sometimes. The seven weeks, sixty-two weeks, that's where you get the time and when Jesus walks into Jerusalem. And the reason why I say that is because Zechariah 9 9 tells you how he's going to come in, and Daniel chapter 9 tells you when he's going to come in. There was no question for the Jewish people. Now it gets fun, and now we read about uh, Palm Sunday. Luke 19, 28-44. Jesus says, when he said, when, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem, and it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethany and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, which is the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, it doesn't say who, saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied. Hmm, that word sounds familiar, doesn't it? From Zechariah 9. On which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. By the way, when you read the account later on, that's exactly what the disciples say, and nobody gives them a hard time. That's a lesson for you and me. If Jesus tells you to say something, say it how he, how he told you to say it, and no one's going to give you a hard time. The enemy can't stand in front of the Word of God. Enemy cannot. So those who were sent went their way, and found just as he had said to them, but as, could you imagine, you're one of the two, you're walking, you're like, oh my goodness, it's exactly like he said. This is crazy. Um, I used to work for, a lot of people know Paul. I used to work, he was very good at giving directions. This is before, by the way, this is before Maps and MapQuest. Who's ever heard of MapQuest? Okay, great. This is before there was an app called Maps. You could even get directions online. People had to write maps for you. Paul was so good at writing out maps that we, my friend and I, had a joke that Paul would say, okay, so when you get there, there's going to be a mailbox on the right hand side. There's going to be a guy standing right there. The detail he would tell you on his drawings was incredible. The reason why, look at the detail Jesus gives them. And it happens exactly as he says it. But as they were loosing the cold, verse 33, the owners of it, it's some stranger's cold. And just someone comes to your car and says, hey, I need to borrow your car. For what? The master needs it. Well, go tell the master to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Who's the master? The Lord has need of him. There's no argument from the man. Because God needed this cold. Why? Because it was prophesied. And it was going to happen. Nothing's going to stand in the way of God's prophecy, by the way. Amen. I don't care. What's happening today in the world is exactly how God... God knew it was going to happen. That's why as Christians we shouldn't be freaking out. Because Christian, it's going to get worse. And I'm going to share some of the things that it's going to happen. 
And they brought it to Jesus. They, the Lord did it. And they brought the colt to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the colt. And they sat. And they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was not now drawing near the seven mile of the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. That's directly from um, uh, uh, Psalm chapter 118. Blessed is the in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Isn't that always the case? When you start worshiping Jesus, doesn't the enemy say, Shut up! Always. There's always the enemy there standing. Because the, the enemy knows worship brings heaven to here. Powers. There's power in worship. Now, I love this. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. Not the rolling stones. <laughs> Someone said that, that would have been the first rock concert. <laughs> just, just, you know, some, well, pastors are corny. Just deal with it. All right. Here's the part that I want to talk about. Chapter, verse 41. Now, as he drew me in. Now, if, I've never been to Israel, but I've seen a lot of pictures. The Mount of Olives is... Like, and it, it's got like, like a road that comes down along the side and overlooks Jerusalem. So now imagine, he's coming down, he's got a view of Jerusalem right in front of his eyes. He's seeing it from, isn't it funny, he's seeing it from on high. It's the same view he has today of us. And he wept. He wept. There's only two accounts in the Bible where Jesus cries. He didn't cry on the cross, he didn't cry in the garden. Cried two places. One, he cried out the garden of uh, the, the tomb of Lazarus because he didn't create death. That was, death was never part of God's creation. Sin, when sin entered, death entered with it. But at Lazarus's tomb, he just shed a tear or two. This word wept in the Greek is he was convulsive. Like, like he was obvious, like he couldn't hide in his crime. The Bible basically is, the Greek word is, he's, it's from his inner core that's coming out. That's how broken he is, because why? Jesus said, if you had known. Even you, especially in this, your day, this day was for the nation of Israel. The things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you and your enemy will build an embarkment around you, surround you, and close you on every side. Hey, hello? Is that not today with Israel? Every side of Israel right now is an enemy. Is it not? What friendly is on every side? Jordan is the only one thing? Every side of Israel right now is an enemy. And level you and your children within, within you to the ground, and they will not leave you with one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You know, you've heard many, many different scholars say this, but everybody has a visitation. Everybody, everybody around in the world has a visitation where Jesus comes and makes himself known to them. And it's either reject or receive. Because Jesus knows that with Him there's peace. Without Him, there is no peace. The only peace there is without Him is the world wants a piece of this, and a piece of this, and a piece of this. Whereas with Jesus, even through all the difficulties and the pains and sufferings, there is still peace. There should always be peace in our hearts, church, whether we're alive on earth, or we go see him. Because Paul said, for me to live is, uh, live is Christ and to die is gain. One way or another, I win. Jesus is with me either way. Norma asked me before, does it rain in heaven? I'm like, no. Does it rain in heaven? There's no sun in heaven. You know why? Because Jesus is as bright as the sun. Think about it.
I have to read a couple things from Charles Spurgeon because he's so powerful, but Charles Spurgeon said something. He said that the greatness of his grief may be seen again by the fact that it, over, it, it overmastered other very natural feelings which might have been, and perhaps were ex ex excited by the occasion. Our Lord stood on the brow of the hill where he could see Jerusalem before him in all its beauty. What thoughts it awakened in him. I mean, think about it. Spurgeon makes you think, like, what went through his mind, you think? At that mind, at that point, Jesus right there was thinking like God. I mean, he's always thinking about God, but like, at that point, he's like, he's now thinking eternal. His memory was stronger and quicker than ours, for his mental powers were unimpaired by sin, and he could remember all the great and glorious things. By the way, Jerusalem has witnessed some great things. You know, uh, conquering kings coming in, David, and so, great kings like Solomon, and wonderful things. And then Jesus chose to say, instead of celebrating, he wept. From a practical lesson, he said, we may remark that this weeping of the Savior should much encourage men to trust Him, he said. Those who desire His salvation may approach Him without hesitation, for His tears prove His hearty desires for our good. The fact that Jesus cried here is a good thing. What do I mean by that? He cares for the souls of people. How much do you think He's weeping over America today? I mean, I don't know. Christian, we should be weeping over America. Okay, the whole world, but I live in America. We should be weeping over America today. I raised my child in America. Grandchildren, eventually, in America. Listen, of course, everybody wants Jesus to come back tomorrow, right? But if he doesn't, what happens? We're here. How much are we fighting for the truth? In Psalm 118, there's a song. Um, basically, whoopsie. I'll come back to that. The Bible says, Save now, I pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We are blessed, we are blessed you from the we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. That's exactly what they were crying out. It's what they were screaming when Jesus was entering. Now look, did they mean it? Did they mean it? I don't think so. Because literally, four days later, they were yelling crucified. Remember, everybody has an agenda with Jesus. Not everybody, but there are some that have a major agenda with Jesus. It's amazing how quick, quickly man changes, right? Your perspective of, of things. Today you're wrong if you love Jesus. Listen to what I'm saying very carefully. Today you're wrong if you love Jesus. God is okay. But which God? Who knows which God, right? But Jesus? No, thank you. He's a bigot. He's an anti everything Church, if you can't see how dark this world has become, then your eyes are equally closed. Or we're choosing to ignore it. We are being like the children of Israel, ignorant to the truth. And we're neglecting the truth. Did you guys see this guy, little Nas, whatever his name is, X, whatever? He, he, he released this sneaker, thank you. Brand new, just came out. Um, so the funny thing is, you can't see it here. You're gonna, you're gonna see it there. You turn around and look at it. Okay. You see the red on the bottom? That's human blood, by the way. You see the pentagram on top there? That's the that's the sign of the devil. Luke 10:18 sounds cute because it's a Bible verse, but Luke 10:18 is I saw Satan falling from heaven. And the little number on the side there, right there is 666. He only made 666 pairs. Oh, and it can be yours for a thousand dollars. You say no thank you. Do you know how many people are going to line up to get that? The resale value, because I know about resale value, the resale value is probably triple what the people are going to pay. That's okay. 
That's okay. You see, look, this is, I'm trying to make a point. That is acceptable. No problem. Mr. Potato Head, not acceptable. Dr. Seuss, not acceptable. You want me to go on? But we're sitting on the sidelines and saying, hey, it's just a little. Um, Cardi B and these other people and the Grammys dancing like strippers. Dancing like strippers. That's okay. That's okay. But calling a boy a boy and a girl a girl, not okay. Do you know that in California, there, actually, where was your oh, goodness? It's either somewhere on the West Coast. The teacher said, he told his kids, students, do not call your mom, parents mom and dad. Because that's not gender inclusive. You want me to go on? They're teaching five-year-olds about sex. Not the sex that we know. That is pure from God. They're teaching them that they don't have to choose their gender until they're ready. But I have a penis! It's biology! It's science! No, no, not that science. Our science is right. Up is down, and down is up. And if we don't see that church, I'm sorry, we're just as blind as the world. And if you ignore it, I think God will hold us accountable. I'm not saying fight people, argue with them. I'm not saying that. But you know what? You defend and you stand up for the truth. Because God, Jesus would do that. And look, just because the government says it's okay, doesn't make it okay if it goes against the Bible we read. Look, I pray for our government. I pray for our president, our vice president. But I will tell you one thing. I don't care who's president. I will sit and say, Lord, if the decisions they make go against your word, then cause them to be confused and stop these laws. We should be praying those prayers. The Bible says we should pray for our leaders, but if your leaders are putting, you know, if your leaders are putting laws that are anti-word of God, church, what's going to happen next? Um, strip clubs can still can have 50% of people inside them. Churches are still at 25%. Why do you think the devil does that? Because the devil knows that when Christians come together and worship the Lord, powerful things happen. So what does he do? He keeps them separate. Jesus said in, in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, as you see the day approaching, the evil day, the bad stuff happening, he said, that is cause for you to get together and encourage one another. Why? Because that's the only encouragement we have. I don't watch the news anymore. I don't watch any news anymore. I refuse. Why? Because all of it is nonsense now. What if you ever opened up the news and you heard some good news? Positive. We got some positive news for you. No? Another tragedy, another this, another that, and this tree another thing, and this tree another that. I mean, they spent three days on Biden tripping up the stairs. Get nothing else to do? Okay, the man fell up the stairs and happens. I mean, literally, it happens. How many of us are falling up the stairs? <laughs> they're sitting there and they're mocking and they're spending days on it. And all the memes that came out from it is ridiculous. How about focus on other things that are happening? How about the, 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 the sex trafficking that's happening at our southern border right now that you have kids coming without their parents? Who's going to pick up those kids? By the way, look, we were just there. We were in El Paso. El Paso is literally 90 miles from Juarez, two miles. Where the house we rented, I look over the backyard and I see Juarez, Mexico. I see the Rio Grande and I see the border wall. There's a saying in El Paso, by the way. You build a 25-foot wall, we find a 26-foot ladder. <laughs> Walls don't really stop. Look, it prevents it, but they find ways in. By the way, you know how they come in? Through the sewer system. They pop up in the middle of the sewer. But you know what? 
Now, with the way things are going right now, I mean, nobody's talking about a 90-year-old girl that drowned in the Rio Grande. Did you guys know that? Right. Because it doesn't fit the narrative. A 90-year-old girl drowned coming across because she wants to cut across the border. And the Rio Grande is gross. They interviewed four girls, 12-year-old, uh, four children, a 12-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 14-year-old. No parents. They're coming into America. Who's going to pick up those people? The sex traffickers! Well, Juarez, Mexico, because I said, hey, let's go to Juarez. My employees were like, don't go to Juarez. Why? You may not come out. Is this thing? That we're Americans and we have money and we have everything, they'll grab us, they'll bite, kidnap Tully, and they'll strip us naked and leave us on the side of the road and take everything in to die. By the way, it's not only Mexicans that are crossing the border. There's a lot of terrorism coming across the southern border too. God help this nation. It's supposed to be Palm Sunday. I know, I know. Look, if Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem then, what is he doing over this nation now? We're the absolute laugh laughing stock of the world. There's a video by, and I hate to quote this man, Bashar Assad. It's on neoliberalism. Look it up. He's the president of Syria. Aren't you Syrian? <laughs> You're not supposed to. He speaks about neoliberalism and what leads to like a downfall of a nation. And it's America today. It, but, but you know what it is? He's a crazy man, by the way. But we're a joke to the world. And by the way, forget about all this. It has nothing to do with all oh, this and that and this and that. The only reason why the Bible says very clearly, money there's no king, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Obviously, there's no king in this nation. And I don't mean leader. I mean Jesus has to be king in a person's life for them to do what's right, to, to desire to follow the law. And until America turns to Jesus, we're going to remain a joke. Way back, way back, way back then, Alexis de Tocqueville from France, he, this was like in the early 1700s, he was touring America, right? And he was coming, well, it was the late 1700s, this was after he declared independence, but he came into America, and he was, because he wanted to see why America was so prosperous, and why America was so successful. And he came here, you know, by boat, and then by buggy, by a horse and carriage, and he, and he went around, and then he goes back to, um, he goes back to France, and they asked him a question, they said, you know, why, so what's America's secret? And he goes, you know what, I, I, I went through America and I went everywhere. He goes, I went to the state house and I didn't find anything there. I went to the courthouse and I didn't find anything there. I went to the schoolhouse, I didn't find anything there. He goes, until I walked into America's churches and saw their pulpits ablaze, it is then I found them. He goes, America is, what did he say? He said, America, I forgot, the, the, there's a specific quote. It basically says that if America ceases to be good, you know, that, at that point, they, they won't say, so what do I mean by that? It means until America turns to Jesus, it's going to be no success in this nation. It's going to be like, like this. It's like the stock market. Up and down. You can never hold your hope out in the stock market. One day it's up, one day it's down. One day it's up, one day it's down. You know, we say God bless America. Which God is going to bless America? I, I'd like to know. Because it, is it the God of sex? Because right now, you realize everything is sexualized. Is it the God of money? Is it the God of Hollywood? The God of Washington? Which God? Because it's not the God of Hollywood. Every chance people get today, unfortunately, they mock God. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. We should, like Jesus, be weeping over this nation.
And we as a church have to wake up because Jesus is at the door. John, in the book of 1 John, says that Jesus, it is the last hour, he said. That was 2,000 years ago. What is it today? It's the last second. Nanosecond? Millisecond? Look, I started my message about Bible prophecy and how it translates to Palm Sunday. And look, it's true. Israel was given a warning. Israel was told that their Messiah was coming and they kind of blew it, right? Jesus said, there was a peace that was for you guys and unfortunately you guys ignored it. You neglected it. And it destroyed you. Today the Bible speaks of things happening. But Christian, we have to know it. We have to, we have to see it. And we have to be ready for it. I mean, it talks about, the Bible talks about wars and rumors of wars. The Bible speaks about it. Sicknesses and, and odd diseases, the Bible speaks about it. Hunger and famine, the Bible speaks about it. Lawlessness, which means you have no regard for law, the Bible speaks about it. Hatred, the Bible speaks about it. Oh, here's one, ethnic battles. Ethnicity against ethnicity. Not America versus Russia. Ethnicity is the biggest battle today, is it not? Ethnic battles. The Bible speaks about it. Nations rising up against nations. The Bible speaks about it. They all should sound familiar. And for you and for me, we should be getting ready. We shouldn't neglect it. And I know it's like, oh, it's not really fun. No, no, no. Being a Christian should be really exciting these days. Every time something happens, we should be like, wow, the Bible says that's going to happen. It should increase our faith. It should get us excited for Jesus' return. It should make us tell people what, uh, tell, tell people, uh, you know, that they're going to be lost forever if they ignore. But we can't, we can't do any of that or know any of it if we're not reading our Bibles. Charles Spurgeon said, half our fears arise from the neglect of the Bible. Half our fears arise from the neglect of the Bible. Are, we, are you constantly fearful? Well, you got to get more Bible in you. More Bible, more faith. Less Bible, less faith, which equals more fear. Jesus came to remove our fears. When Jesus told the people, I am going to give you peace, he said, the peace that was offered to you now is no longer. Don't you think look? You know a Christian that's really walking with the Lord, right? I'm not saying that, you know, some people go through a lot of difficult times and it's very normal, you're walking with the Lord. But you know what? That person, even though they're, they're going through trouble, there's a different set of, there's a different peace that is upon them. It's almost like saying, yeah, my, my life's a mess, but Jesus loves me and I'm good. Because we know it. Amen. Jesus could come, the trumpet can blow, and we could go. Okay, so let me give you a few verses that says Jesus is coming quickly. First one. Behold, I am coming quickly. This is Jesus talking. Not, a, not an angel, not John. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Another one. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his or her work. Um, the day Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he announced to the world that I am the Messiah, I am the King, I am the Savior. But not the type, and basically he was telling them, I'm not the type of savior that you are. You are. They were expecting to know his visitation. Like, they wanted someone to save them from their current troubles. Jesus is saying, I want to save you from your eternal troubles. That's why I'm here. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save, to save the world. Listen, I don't have to tell you that Jesus is coming tomorrow. I don't. Because what's good in tomorrow is any moment.
Look, I, I kind of want to be that pastor that, that, that says that Jesus is coming and then it happens. Because oftentimes I find that when you tell, you know, when you share with the church that Jesus is coming, I think that it kind of goes over their head. They're like, yeah, well, we've heard it many, many times. And I understand that. But every day it's closer. Just like every day we grow older, death is closer. By the way, the minute a baby is born, the death clock starts. Technically, right? I know it's kind of sad to hear it, but the baby, minute a baby is born, they're going to get older, and it gets good that way. It goes in that direction. This is not Benjamin Button where you go backwards. That'd be cool, by the way. I hope that the church is ready. Palm Sunday was prophetic. It was fulfilled. And what? And you know what? Before we even know it, it's going to happen. No one expected what's happening today. It just was like one day to the other. What, what, what happened? We can't go anywhere? Boom, stop. One day, Jesus is going to come back even quicker. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, it says that when he had spoken these things, he, had, he was taken up. The Bible says he slowly went up. A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. Behold, two men stood by them and said, Men of Galilee, why, are you, why, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? <coughs> this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The disciples were standing there like, okay, he went up. He should be coming back any minute now. They were excited for his return. But the angels were like, okay, guys, go. You have plenty of work to do now. Go spread the gospel. And don't come when he's ready. Go. You just be ready. Will I be ready? Will you be ready? Listen, when, when, when he comes... When he returns, there's going to be great celebration in heaven, yet there's going to be weeping on earth. Weeping. Because the second, first time he came as a humble king. Uh, um, forgive me, let me back up. First time he came as the humble Messiah. Second time he comes, it's going to be as a conquering king. The soul of people are so important to God that even during the tribulation, in Revelation chapter 14, an angel flies through the atmosphere screaming the gospel again. 14.6. Revelation 14.6. You think the soul of man is not important to God? Even to the last second, he gives them an opportunity. I pray that we take Jesus seriously. Because he takes us seriously. Serious enough to die for our sins. Let me finish with this. Martin Luther, we know the great scholar Martin Luther. He was one, once reading the account of Abraham offering Isaac, like as a devotion for family, his family, on the altar in, in Genesis chapter 22. Now his wife was a really tough woman. You know the story of his wife, she's tough. His wife turned to him and said, I don't believe it. God would not have treated his son like that. Like talking about how Abraham was putting Isaac on the altar. He said, God would never have put his son, treated his son like that. And Luther, being the man that he is, he turned around and said, but Katie, he did. Jesus, Father, sacrificed his son for you and for me. And what this week does, what this triumphal entry does, if Jesus walked in, he came into Jerusalem riding a donkey, and he was proclaiming to the world that I am the one that you're looking for. I am the one that makes for your peace. With who? Peace with God. Because if you're not, if you're still in your sin, you are in, in enmity of God, the Bible says. You're an enemy of God. And it's not you necessarily saying it is the enemy of God. And the devil wants us to believe that we are okay. You know, you know what the number one religion in the world is? Okay. The religion of a good person. I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't kill. I don't lie. They lie. 
I don't steal. And then it goes on and on and on. It's like, okay, but Jesus, the Bible says in, in, in James chapter 3 that if you, if you break one commandment, you broke them all. So my encouragement to you this week, today, is as you prepare for this week, first of all, think about what Jesus did. Think about Jesus entering Jerusalem. He came on a mission. He knew where he was going. Jesus knew his destination was the cross. He didn't care about anything else that was going to happen. He, the, the, the arguments he was going to have with the Pharisees, the, 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 the mocking, he, didn't, he knew that he had a destiny with the cross. Why? Because he knew that was the only way to save the world. And he did it. He did it knowing that people are going to reject him. Is that an old saying, right? Jesus would have come and died. You were the only person that ever sinned. You, you were the only person alive. Jesus would have still come and died. And I believe it. Because he proves it day in and day out. Does he not deal with you one on one? That makes you like, oh man, Jesus, you love me so much. Why? <laughs> yeah. And that's my encouragement. I know it was a very encouraging message, but I hope it did encourage you to get excited for his return. By the way, what I showed you there, some of the things that I shared, is only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more going on in the world today that you don't hear about, that I don't even hear about. It's coming, though. It's coming. Please pray. Pray that the enemy's uh, plans are, are, are at least interrupted. And I believe the Spirit of God can do it. And I believe in His patience and His love for people, He will do it. In order to save one soul, He will do it. Remember, it rained at the conference many years ago for one soul. But look at what she's done. God uses these things. Why am I here? You know what? Ask the Lord why you're here. There's a reason why you're here. God doesn't put you anywhere for no reason. Just look to Him. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit always works and your spirit always speaks. Father, how good you are. How generous, how faithful you are, Lord. Father, we, don't, we do not deserve the faithful and the love that you shower upon us. Yet, Lord, you do it without ever questioning without ever saying we don't deserve it. If we don't, you still get it. Jesus, you didn't have to come into Jerusalem. Because it was written, Lord, you did. And because you knew that there was no other way, you went to the cross, Lord. Father, we are just... I don't think there's a word in any language, Lord, to show how grateful we are, Lord. Thank you doesn't do it. May our, may our lips the thank you that comes out of our lips, Lord, our actions actually meet together. May we always be grateful for what you've done, what you do, and what you're going to do. Jesus, I pray this week, many are, 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 are turning their lives over to you, Lord, in this opportunity to celebrate and to remember what you've done with us. I pray, Lord, that we, we never forget you are the humble Messiah, Lord, and who came in to Jerusalem, Lord, to make for peace, to make peace, Lord, with God, that we can make peace with God. Amen. Jesus, may we never forget the power of the cross. Mm -hmm. May we never forget how our sins could be on the cross, Lord. But yet your blood is so powerful that it washes away not just my sins, but the sins of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. For your great love and mercy. I pray this for this nation, Lord. Lord, it's, it's so obvious that, that, that darkness has, it's almost like in Egypt, Lord, where it's just settled. And Father, this nation doesn't really want you anymore. It's, it's heartbreaking. But yet, Lord, you still, you still bless this nation. Just, Lord, I'm amazed by your love. 
I pray, Lord, whatever plans the enemy has, Lord, I pray you interrupt them and break them, Lord, in Jesus' name. I would just give this nation one, one, one more chance, Lord. One last revival, Lord. May many turn to you this week, Lord. And may there be celebrations in heaven because of souls being saved. We pray for our family members, Lord, that are lost. We pray for our friends that are lost, Lord. Father, they are just entangled by the lie. Loose them, I pray, like you loose the cult. Loose them, I pray, Lord. And may they be humbled before you and turn to you in salvation. We look to you now, Jesus. Bless your people. Bless the sweet and go before us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.